Welcome to Discograffiti's Private Press, the Patreon-exclusive podcast that takes buried treasure one step farther. This treasure is buried so goddamn deep, there's probably no way you'll ever find it in your lifetime, not at least in its original iteration. And so thus, if music's your thing, I mean really, really your thing, and obviously it is, because here you are, and here we are, you'll not experience any more value for your listening dollar than with this series. One thing we can all agree on in here, our favorite dessert is definitely mint, but we'll settle for near mint in a pinch. I'm your co-host, Dave Gebro. And I'm your ulterior motive host, Paul Major. Uh, the only ulterior motive is to shove these uh, sonic nuggets in your ear hole. In this episode of The Private Press, we'll be lifting the lathe on the 500 original copies of the New Dawn's 1970 Private Press LP, There's a New Dawn. Because this is uh, this was made in 1970, it really has that vibe, Paul. Let's talk about the exhaustion of the 1960s hangover. Uh, that cloud that hangs over uh, some very uh, special LPs from that time. Right. Yeah, this is uh, the 60s dream, the idealism, the yeah. we're going to change the world. And it's not the it's not the Altamont, uh, Meredith Hunter, knife in the back, screaming. And yeah, you know, this is it's not that. Driven. It's more like a fug, like a vibe, like you don't want to get out of bed, right? Yeah, it's, it, it's like disillusionment uh, the whole sound of it emphasizes the way the lyrics come across calling it a new dawn there's a new dawn that's like something from 1966 or 67 we're going to this new world it's all going to be better through pharmaceuticals and love and we're all going to take care of each other men are going to live together in peace and this is real uh world weary realizing wait a minute and it's, it's funny the, yeah the, the dream is over <laughs> the dream is over and yet the title of the goddamn record is all about promise and what's around the corner and it's a fucking concept album about a guy who's going to kill himself right and out of the gate with the first track and i see a day and it's time already yeah it's like well the world's in trouble you know yeah. already yeah. The, it's like this is this is one of the rare records uh, that you proffer in your book. And by the way, this is you can find this in Paul's incredible fucking book. Uh, Feel the music. I'm going to say it in every episode. Feel the music, the psychedelic worlds of Paul Major. Uh, on page 92, you can find uh, a, a short missive uh, about this record. But uh, this is one of the rare ones that I knew about beforehand. Uh, and uh, this is, don't know if you know about this website, but it's no longer, unfortunately. There was a website called Chris Goes Rocks. Have you heard of this, Paul? No, I don't know that, no. This is going back in the mid-2000s to the late 2000s. Uh, Chris Goes Rocks was tons of, it was a guy out of Sweden, and uh, even the awkward name you know still my playlist uh, in my itunes of tracks that are you know cherry picked from uh from psychedelic private press stuff mm -hmm. is called chris goes rocks uh -huh. it introduced so much stuff to me for private press psych stuff uh years and years before i discovered uh, your book it was chris goes rocks and i would just pluck you know, anything that I didn't love the whole record, but it was like two tracks I couldn't live without, I would mm -hmm. put it in the playlist. So the new dawn came out of that. So I've been familiar with the record for quite some time, and it's very unique. You know, first of all, you know, the cool thing about it is here is a record that came out in 1970, and you'd give your fucking left nut to ensure people that there's no way that this could be anything after 1966. First of that all, there's that roller rink organ that comes out of 66. Everything about it screams 66. Yeah, it screams uh, music machine, strawberry alarm clock, et cetera, garage band go going into the psychedelic. And, uh, all the yard birds. Song, songs being highly arranged. It's not solo jamming stuff. When the fuzz guitar comes in, it's uh, used in a structural way 
And, yeah. uh, and, and there's and there's Raga moves, but not late Raga moves, more like see my friends Raga moves. Mm -hmm. All Absolutely. of it's very consistent with 66. Absolutely. Which is uh, one of the uncanny things about it and why it's so perfect. It, it came out in 1970. It's like yeah. a bookend to bookend to that era to the uh, uh, the dream is over. It's it's it's. Yeah. A book and it's extremely personal as well which is uh amazing to me and this uh came out of uh portland i think they worked out of salem oregon but proximate to uh to portland and the band had formed in 1966 and unusual for these bands they were a working band they quit their day jobs and toured hmm. clubs and stuff in the pacific northwest california all the way up to alaska wearing matching suits like a lounge band would uh playing nightclubs and so forth so they were actually a working band for uh several years until soon and after is, let's after talk about band. who they are this is dan bassey on lead vocals and drums so we got ourselves uh, a don henley don't we yeah he sings he writes and he is the member of the band uh it's consistent through uh, a couple of reunions and things. Have he, you talked uh, with Dan? Have you ever? Uh, had no, a no. Okay. I, I have a mixed feeling about that part of it because of uh, the nature of how this album uh, hit me. I almost don't want to know how uh, intentional the way it works as a concept album for me. The right. structure. Yes. Of, I almost want to, you know, not not that it would spoil it one way or the other but uh i, I to me my mind has oh, a we range. gotta track him down man no we, we can get a hold of him definitely yeah, yeah. he should be on a uh on a show for sure but uh you know i, I would wonder you know mm, you know i'd the like way to track this like guy that. down and live with him i mean this guy is very intriguing to me a concept album about suicide a one-off thing we don't know where the hell i don't know anything about dan Nothing. yeah i'm curious and i guess the thing is uh you know the way it opens up there's a new dawn there are water and bird effects the sun is rising after that brilliant little rod serling sort of intro not uh, just hold on but wait not just like uh all this uh all these sound effects which by the way are very forward in the mix uh but the vocals which are not dan it's bill gartner oddly they get some guy who's not even part of the band and uh the strange decision there is they got perfect a perfectly fine vocalist with dan bazzi yet they get this whole other guy who either has a cold or has such a pinched adenoidal delivery that it's kind of like this. And it's very strange that they get, that they get a whole other guy who this is what he offers. It's a real plus for me. And uh, me I think he, he did write some of the songs too. He did? Yeah, yeah. I love his voice. And I, uh, it's one thing that can blow up for a lot of psychedelic records. If the vocal doesn't, you know, if it's either too perfect or too bluesy or feeling of this is perfect with the haunted mood of the music, the world weary resignation and, uh, you know, the, the whole dream is over thing. And uh, I love just, it. it. The reason I, you know, came up with the concept of, of course, is because the fir first few songs right out of the gate, even the first song, there's a little bit of premonition, you know, uh, uh, and uh the next song is he's imagining a day when men will all live together but it's you can tell in the song you know he already knows it's not really going to happen and it goes on from that you know to more warnings about the world then it becomes personal about relationship with a girl First, before we even move forward because uh you know i i for my money the very first song is my favorite song on the album uh the there's a new dawn is my favorite I, I it's always been my favorite from the record because there's a very lovely drowsy sort of a vibe to it i love the drowsiness of this yeah. record. it there's it's almost like a yawn and a stretch the yeah. whole fucking record's like a yawn and a stretch the folk stuff the rockers the psych all of it is a yawn and a stretch 
It is, and it's a stretch into otherworldliness as, as well. That's, yeah. I, I love the relaxed sense of it, which is also appropriate compared to the you know what we were talking about, 66 and before, which was a younger, more worlds opening up, vibrant vibe. And this is like those elements after they've been weathered by time and they're just about gone. Right. And- so the area that they're in, before we continue with the record, um, the area that they're in, be- besides the new Don, you have the new Tweedy brothers, right? Right. Um, uh, the Sonics. Sonics earlier. Yep. Uh, what else is going on out there? The Wipers. Yeah, the Wipers. Later, there there were uh, some other private pressings. Of course, more, more in the Garage Band or you know not psychedelic uh, sort of thing. There were things like the the group Salem Mass, uh, which was more like a mixture of backwoods and progressive want to be progressive rock with a dark thing but not a staying power like the new dawn so so these guys uh, there's a, a brief stint where they're where they're playing as the sound citizens right right and then the new dawn is formed and uh in 67 or i should say by 67 the new dawn are essentially a nightclub band they're touring. Right, they're, they're touring. They're a working right, band. Right, right, they're, they're, touring. Touring. Yeah. Uh, they're touring throughout the Northwest, going down through California and Nevada, and as far north as Alaska. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, that's what separates these guys from, you know, from a lot of the rest of the bands in your book. So the New Dawn uh, record and release, there's a New Dawn in July 1970. Right. Uh, the songs are composed in the studio and recorded late at night after gigs, Uh right? So initially it's the 500 copies that that are pressed, but it's estimated that only about 200 may still exist. Right, survived, of which 38 seal copies uh, came through me. I wish I still, you know, had some. Even then it was a big deal. Like uh, I'd paid good for them uh, through the producer, Gary Neeland, uh, it took me a year to get a hold of those. Uh, I got a hold of him a couple of times, and then all I could ever do is talk to his girlfriend at the time. And the story was he owned a house, and he thinks there's some copies of the record in the attic, but the house is rented to somebody else. So we'll get over there someday and check it out, you know. And at that point, I was saying I'll, I'll give you fifty bucks a copy for as many as you can find, which was then again back in the day. Uh, you know, reasonable money. Eventually, uh, what I did was, uh, since I was talking to his girlfriend, I said, like, I really want this to happen. If you can motivate him, I'll send you like 500 bucks, you know, just to you as a side deal. And it happened soon after that. Uh, They got out of the attic, the box came, 38 sealed copies, and they they didn't last too, well, they last a few years because I was charging a really high price uh, for that record compared to, you know, top money at up there with what the you know so big- what 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 exactly so a lot of the records from that are, uh, initial pressing they were either damaged because right. of because of travel or they were they were warped and yeah some warped and some lost on the road because they were selling them at shows right so, right and, uh, mostly at the live shows uh, that was the the distribution and their one their one opportunity to hit the big time came the following year in 1971 when the abc dunhill records label expressed interest uh in the demo of three of three new heavier sounding songs right it wasn't it wasn't the folky uh, the folky vibe Um, right and so uh considering the success abc dunhill had had with steppenwolf the demo tracks which are included on the uh, on the CD, on the CD only, right? Right, not on the vinyl. Yeah, right. They demonstrate uh, what a great fit the band could have been for the label, uh, and gives us a glimpse into what could have been for the New Dawn. But they they faded into the sunset after yeah, they lost the time. Then you know they went off to various other you know careers. They reformed and they did do some more shows and that. And they, but, lived, uh, they lived motel to motel for a while, right? I mean, yeah, so exactly. You can't really- once they started started you know getting married and having families. Of course, the being on on the road motel thing 
not making a lot of money just wasn't feasible anymore. And uh, right. once again, the dream was over. <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, Yoga Ono, the voice of um, the dream is over. I just, it's actually what I hear in my voice over and over is the magical misery tour version of her saying it. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Yeah, the National Lampoon. Um, so in January 2008, there was a reunion show, and it was uh, Bazzi accompanied by his son, Dan, on rhythm guitar, mm -hmm. uh, Russ Hosley on, or Hosley, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, on lead guitar. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Karen, yeah. Karen Purdom on bass. All, uh, all different people from the original. And he's still... Uh apparently looking at a little thing you know is still going moved into doing contemporary christian music. oh really is that the, yeah. is that the case so and, that's uh, interesting yeah. i i look forward to talking with him about this because yeah. how you get from a concept album a, a psych concept album about suicide to christian music is a path that i definitely want to speak with him about right. and or, bill gartner uh I guess the other would be main uh, main guy. He also he had moved to Chicago after the band uh, happened and had a Christian orientated band in Chicago. He passed away. I think it was in the nineties or something. Hmm. Dan's still going. And one thing about you know this is, I guess the big question that I don't know want to know the answer to. Almost to me, it seems apparent with the layout of the album and especially the last two tracks. It's a uh, suicide. It's not just, uh, you know, the last morning is like mixed with life goes on. You love that. Eternal. You love the milkman. I, I will get to that. Oh, it's the best. We're going to get, we're gonna get to that. It's a sick touch. Um, but so, uh, so, so I, I, I wonder how intentional, you know, is it yeah. ultra serendipity? It just seems to me it's too uncanny that those songs weren't laid out in that sequence. Yeah. Right, right, right. And so let, let's talk about the band a little bit before we get dive back into the record. But um, Dan Bazzi, lead, lead vocals and drums, Joe Smith on lead guitar, Bobby Justin on bass, Bill Gartner um, ha has lead vocals on, on the first track, uh, which is There's a New Dawn. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, what else is he on? Um, Dark Thoughts. Mm -hmm. And then... Um, uh last morning and life goes on right larry davis playing organ and, and rhythm guitar so there's 500 copies on the original pressing uh, how much of the, is this thing worth paul when i had the quantity i was asking top dollar this is back uh, they were gone by the 90s except for a few i held back for trades only but i was doing them for four but now there are copies that have sold up you know to three grand um you can look and see it uh the pop psych site or discogs and see what uh the most went there or but then you find out you know, a lot of these deals go between people like me with the dark or other things where they've gone more but i would suspect now it's a case uh which we learned with albums like the music emporium where a large number of steel copies much more than the new dime but a substantial number were around the quality of the record made it so that at the initial time it was almost a deterrent it, am i charging too much is there enough of market to bear but now i'm saying three thousand dollars easy for a sealed copy but the kind of thing it could you know if two people wanted it and it was the only one around it's so strong it could, it could do a stonewall or something like that where they, this rare album stonewall hard rock album sold for fourteen thousand dollars but i suspect if there were several copies available, it, you know, it was two people battling over the one copy at the one time, thinking they'll never see it again, you know. So right. so I'd say a solid 3,000, you know, if it shot up you know, way higher or something, uh, it's possible then a couple people that have one of those, you know, 38 sealed copies that I uncovered or something like that might, you know, you know, a couple of them might decide, oh, okay, you know, I'll, I'll let it go, you know, or something. But, yeah. um, well, what's, the, what's, the, what's the most amount of money that's ever been paid for this record? There, there were ones around 3000 
that I know of. That's the, that's there was the, like a VG, VG plus copy that was up for uh, over 3000 once and it disappeared. I don't know if, you know, it got sold cheaper or not. It, it but, has, it, I know it has been reissued. I do have a vinyl copy of this record. Have you had any personal encounters with these guys? Not with them, you know, and there is the question and uh, I, I was a, a bit like, maybe I want to keep it mysterious in my mind. But of course, I've read about them, but I haven't talked to them and asked. So these guys you know, are like, are, are these guys gods to you? Uh, yeah, in, in the yeah. sense that, you know, things are leveled out by the real people and all that sort of sense. So they're, they're human beings to me, but I'm astonished. And, and for all these psychedelic records, so many of them wear off, even ones I thought were brilliant over the years. They have a shelf life. This is one of the ones I can honestly say, I probably listened to it hundreds of times in my life easily yeah. with yeah. Atten full attention. Every time is better than the last. And, and, yeah. and everything I like about it just seems more enhanced. The The first song is my favorite, but I see a day, like a fuzz guitar broadside that espouses Raga-influenced experimental living. Right. <laughs> yeah, it, it does that. It has a nice revolving rhythm. I get images sometimes of people in robes dancing around yes. a long light or something. The yeah. lyrics about men living together, the way that uh, it's phrased, I see a day, et cetera, man. Then it suffice kicks in, living together, and he ha, 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 with his voice. <laughs> but already, you know, he's seeing this vision, but he knows it's not going to happen. So it's already right. you know, like a yearning for something that's not going to happen. And when that's the uh, that's overdub of the background vocals come in, that is just as mystical as it gets. Uh, yeah. It's it's unbelievable. It's time. More Raga-like drone moves. This this one, a little bit more uh, in search of a song than most on the LP. But then It's Raining. It's Raining is awesome. Well, I like both of those. Uh, I like It's Time because it develops the thing where the world is really in a bad way. And it's, right. it's time. And I love the recorder. But It's Raining. The structure is awesome. It's a pop song. Also, the girl comes in about, about a girl. First three or more about mankind uh, in general. And... Uh, the the effects are good but when when it kicks in with the little fuzz bit now da, 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 you know yeah, pull yeah, back love. to that 66 you know first uh wave of psychedelia perfectly i love the wind thrash storm yeah I love that stuff uh yeah it's it's raining is awesome hear me crying is a, an amazing ballad very 50s doo-wop influence mm -hmm. that takes you back in time definitely and it's more straightforward overtly it doesn't have this psychedelic moves except the sound of the organ and that it works with it but it's it's more straightforward it does like sort of take you back to an earlier era and he's you know crying about a girl and lost love hear me crying he's trying to reach you know reach her and connect and yeah. it's it's uh it's so em emotionally charged it is it is and then uh and then with dark thoughts yeah. uh, very very simple fuzz garage tune one of the simplest melody lines in garage history the riff and everything is ominous it's coming at you like dark thoughts the way the one voice every time the phrase dark thoughts comes up and dark, dark, dark thoughts yeah i love that and when i first had some of these th this album back uh and i was laying it on to people with the garage psych and that a lot of people could not handle the hauntingness the uh you know they they didn't get like the picture of the world weary and all that that was the track you know I, I i even remember some people saying you know well yeah that track dark thought that's a killer garage punk song i love it i love the harmonic and the desperation it's and, and the fact that it's dark thoughts are coming in ending side one perfectly after the new dawn and all that and, right. and the world gone wrong and all of a sudden you know the reality has become unbearable and he's worried about how he's going to react is it going to be dangerous to somebody it's you know oof. yeah i think it actually uh, uh keeps climbing and getting better after that because i think proud man it's got like a proto spaceman three vibe to it Mm. I like Pr Proud Band better than Dark Thoughts, actually. And Billy Come Lately. They're of a, of a piece for me. Uh, Proud Man 
like after the dark thoughts and that he realizes sort of like in my concept of things you know he's born in poverty and all this stuff but he takes pride and he realizes that he's alive and breathing and that is more than matters more than money or society or whatever he gets pride and and then billy come lately he saunters around he's taking the world at his pace he's in control of himself after all this world gone crazy he's enjoying life in a way he's not in a hurry uh <laughs> and then we'll fall in love uh another unassuming minor key woe is me kind of move mm -hmm. and one of the interesting things to me about that song is we'll fall in love mirroring to me i see a day yeah. we'll fall in love he's not in love he he's imagining falling in love he right, right. In head, will fall in love but it's not there and uh it's so perfect for the disillusionment and the overall vibe of the album the world weariness that you know he's he's escaping into his mind imagining he'll fall in love but he kind of like you can just tell by the mournfulness of it in a way that he knows it's not going to happen <laughs> yet another reason why it's like perfectly requisite spooky creepiness to it exactly I mean, yeah the organ sound and everything it's uh you is uh probably the one that i'm the the least enthusiastic on um, I, would, I would say that too and one reason is like in my concept mind uh of it that's the anomaly like if it were, went from we'll fall in love into last morning that mm -hmm. makes perfect sense but you is like the one glimmer of uh you know joy and happiness in the lyrics and you give me a reason to live so what i project put in my mind was then uh okay he's expressing that humanity men living the other people human beings are what it's all about and that's the only source of joy in this world and that's the only way i could work it in but to me it's the most if there's anything glimmering towards being mundane that's the track for me too that's right. the only track right. that's the only one I give a five that's the one i i it's not, I bad. It's not a bad batting average it's the only one for me no and, and as i listen to the album it, it folds in seamlessly and uh, i enjoy it you know over time it doesn't spoil the vibe at all but that yeah. that is when if it was a weak link on what to me is a perfect yeah, I agree. Album. it's the only tune not bad uh last morning i love just as much as you for the exact same reasons that whole i heard the milkman up the street mm -hmm. bottles battling with the ride I, this one's got vibe to spare i love the oh, space in it. whether or not it's it's uh intentional the space and the production it's just, just a gorgeous song that's awesome and that's when i dj this album for the general public that generally if i'm not doing in the dark thoughts for a garage vibe last morning is the one that i pick the way that the rhythm kicks in after the first verse the expansiveness of it it really sounds open and uh then again it's mournful and for me also in in the my scheme of the album myself too uh when you hear that uh line with the milkman I mean he knows it's the last morning he's he, he's gonna die the other end of a new dawn the end yes. uh, yeah. that image is so spooky and haunting of the symbol of life the milkman up this street with those bottles clanking and it is a new dawn because it's the milkman in the morning but it's the last new dawn right <laughs> uh life goes on uh the last song pretty fittingly simple and spectral conclusion to a great record uh, absolutely this takes it into the eternal for me bonus tracks we got some uh some live tunes <clears throat> i don't even know uh do you have do you wind up i haven't heard i haven't uh heard the bonus tracks only the album the non-lp single but uh i haven't i, I haven't, I haven't heard what is the non-lp single i can't remember the names now it's on discogs Huh. And my impression back then was like they're kind of nice songs, but uh, and I, I, that may change. Yeah, I may see them through the prism of the record now, and they'll fit in. But they seemed uh, to be more like a, a, apart from the album to me, you know. Uh, in the yeah. vibe, you don't need you don't need anything additional on this. And the live the live tracks, they really only serve to kind of water down. It's a concept album. You don't need bonus stuff. No, it's, it's a perfect entity anything else is extraneous it's uh 
to my mind, or, or it's, it's a part, you know, yeah. from it. You, you have the perfect ride. There's nowhere to go after life goes on, except to, here's the guy sitting, looking at his hands, feeling self pity oozing from his glands, waiting to die. And the music's eternal and it's the beat goes on and life goes on, not for him. But, th and that's what I mean when it takes it into the eternal. To me, that's like, you know, these like sometimes goth bands or Joy Division vibes or other things where they're trying to take, talk about death going into the eternal. To me, this is like, you know, nails that vibe in, in such a personal way or something. It's, it's uh, so dark and the ultimate uh, resigned to reality way to end the album is like life goes on not for me but it goes on i know that <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's a really unique album i'd strongly recommend it and and it's got this weird thing to it where it feels like it's blanketed in fog it's very mm -hmm. cloudy there's something maybe to the local scene in, in portland or thereabouts where this right? came from but it's a very unique vibe to the record that elevates even the simpler and less spectacular songs to a different level of effectiveness than they normally would have had. Right. And so, that's why the cover is perfect as well. You yeah. can barely make them out in exactly. the mist yeah. and the fog. Exactly. And mm -hmm. I believe their backs are turned to us. They're so obscured by the, the fog and that cloud that resonates with the sound of the record so perfectly that uh, it's hard to tell. This one, I give four and a quarter stars. Me, you know, for me, I, I'm I'm four and uh you know well I say that about fraction. The only thing for me, the what only, do you give it? Mo, mo, uh, for me, it's five. It's perfect. Uh, yeah. It's a perfect album, and I've learned to live with the song "You." It, do, it 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 doesn't spoil it, but I think for me, it's a perfect five because every time I hear it, the magic and 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 the mood. It, it, it sustained, it, it becomes more mysterious to me over time rather than becoming demystified. Absolutely. By, it it by disappears. So that, it's one of my perfect records of my life uh, uh, for me. So, you know, I, if I was saying to other people, I might bring it down a little bit, depending on where they're coming from or point something out. But, you know. Look, this is just putting it, I'm comparing it to everything I've ever heard in music, not just other pi private press. Right. right. Yeah. I'd say that too. It's one of the most important records, whether it's for me, it's, it, it's a perfect record, you know, yeah. it, and it's probably one of the records I've listened to the most in my life, bar none, you know, Beatles, anybody out of all these, uh, probably garage psych genre, so to speak albums, uh, you know, I, I also get the real people vibe off of it, and it, it's, yeah. it's 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 literally you know that that desert island thing. I I, I I don't think I could not, you know, if I could only hear a small number of things, that would be one of it because I know it's gonna never wear off. Well, Paul, thank you so much for introducing it to me, and in turn to everyone out there in Patreonville. Thank you for joining us for uh, this incredible episode of Private Press. And definitely tune in next week uh, when we are going to be featuring the mind-blowingly what-the-fuck sort of vibe that you're going to be getting from Arcesia. Mm -hmm.